JBS presents a television exclusive, The Der Show with Alan Dershowitz. Today's show is about the L word, the dirty word, liberalism. I will explain to you what a liberal is, and I can do it because I am one. You will hear the case for liberalism as our country moves toward more extremes on the hard left and the hard right. I'll explain the difference between being a liberal, which I am, and a leftist, which I am not, on The Der Show. With the end of the Trump presidency and the end of really the Trump era uh, after his um, acquittal, um, I would have hoped that we could return to a sense of normalcy, by which I mean reopen the marketplace of ideas, stop censorship, stop this kind of cancel culture that we're experiencing. But um, it's just getting worse. It's just getting worse. We're hearing case after case of where social media are banning people, deplatforming people. Uh, Bobby Kennedy has just been taken off uh, his uh, platforms because of his controversial views on on vaccination. Look, I don't agree with Bobby Kennedy uh, on many of the issues that he sets out, but he has the right to express his views. And, and readers and listeners and viewers have the right to accept or reject uh, his views on, on the merits. Uh, we still haven't seen a return of Donald Trump to his various platforms. Now we have a Supreme Court of Facebook, uh, which is supposed to decide all these issues. And their biggest decision so far is that um, Facebook's decision to ban the showing of nipples in an anti-cancer uh, film, in a film about how to identify early uh, breast cancer, uh, the Supreme Court overruled that and said nipples nipples are okay, and it's also okay to insult uh, various ethnic groups. Uh, no standards, ad hoc determinations, and we're still experiencing refusals of universities to invite people who uh, were purportedly in uh, speaking out on behalf of either Trump's policies or Trump's rights. Um, Modern McCarthyism is rampant. But <clears throat> on the show today, I want to make an important distinction. Uh, many on the right, and I hear it all the time on Fox and on Newsmax, and I read it in newspapers, many on the right falsely blame liberals, and listen to the word carefully, liberals for this new McCarthyism. And I'm a liberal. I've been a liberal all my life. That's my identity, a liberal, I'm a liberal. And so I wanna defend liberalism and I wanna distinguish between liberals on the one hand and the left on the other. I'm a liberal, but I'm not a leftist. Yeah, maybe I lean slightly left when you compare me to those who lean slightly right. Yeah, I favor gay rights, I favor a woman's right to choose abortion, I'm in support of uh, environmental uh, remedies, uh, yeah, I, I support fair uh, and equitable taxation, yeah, I uh, espouse reasonable uh, gun control without violating the, the Second Amendment. Yeah, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a liberal, I'm a traditional liberal, and it's not generally the liberals who are pushing for censorship, deplatforming, cancel culture, it's the left. The left has always had a tradition of censorship. The left supported Stalin. The left supported Mao. The left supported many other kind of Castro, uh, uh, the Venezuelan dictators. These are totalitarian dictators of the left who have long supported what uh, many Americans on the left today uh, support free speech for me, but not for the free speech for the left, but not for the right. But liberals don't support that. What is a liberal? A liberal is somebody who supports tolerance, open mindedness, 
a willingness to change one's mind based on debate and the marketplace of ideas. A liberal supports due process. A liberal supports civil liberties, free speech for me, thee, and everybody else. Now, I want to acknowledge that prior to the Trump presidency, there were many, many more liberals out there. Liberalism was a significant part of our culture. And I think the Trump presidency and the hatred that was caused by the anti-Trumpers moved a lot of people away from liberalism toward the intolerant left. And so I think there are fewer liberals today than there ever used to be. And that's a terrible, terrible tragedy, particularly for those of us who support liberalism, kind of a kinder, gentler, more forgiving country, one that seeks fairness, one that's in favor of civil rights for all. Uh, I think we're seeing a diminution of liberalism and a movement, again, in our divided country toward you're either right or you're left. There's no center. There's no more liberal Democrats, conservative Republicans. You're either a right winger or you're a left winger. Um, you know, when the definition of centrist is now Mitch McConnell, because he finally uh, went after uh, Trump having stolen uh, a Supreme Court seat by his maneuvering, we know that we're losing the center. We know that the middle is in trouble. And with the middle being in trouble, traditional liberals and traditional conservatives are being squeezed out. Now, what do traditional liberals and traditional conservatives have in common? Both groups are civil libertarians. Now, again, I'm introducing a different term. I've introduced liberal, conservative, hard right, hard left, and then civil libertarian. A civil libertarian needn't be a liberal. A civil libertarian is one who believes in basically due process, uh, open marketplace of ideas, freedom of speech, fairness, fair trials, uh, the right to counsel. Uh, civil libertarian can be a conservative, can be a Republican. When I was on the national board of the American Civil Liberties Union and then the local board in Massachusetts, we had a lot of Republicans uh, on the board. Conservatives. They were conservative civil libertarians. Today, you have a lot of conservative civil libertarians, but you don't have a lot of left-wing civil libertarians. The only thing that's, that's left on the left for civil libertarians are us liberals. And so liberals are getting a bad name. Uh, we're getting a bad name because there are so few of us. And when you see who's censoring the, the, the Nicholas Kristofs of the world and the common cause, they used to be called liberals. And now... The Trump presidency has pushed them, pushed them, pushed them further left, further toward pick sides, uh, <clears throat> past tests of purity, um, take loyalty oaths. Uh, and I fail all those tests. I don't pass purity tests. I don't take loyalty oaths. I don't pick sides. Uh, for me, I decide every issue on its merits. And when you decide every issue on its merits, it's required that we have an open marketplace of ideas, that every point of view be allowed to be expressed uh, on social media, uh, in the print media, particularly on university campuses, uh, on television. But we're not seeing that. My point of view, a liberal point of view, is hardly heard. I'm too far toward the center for CNN. I'm too far toward the center for Fox um, and many other media. The New York Times uh, wants today only left-wing op-eds. Occasionally, just for purposes of symbolism and symmetry, they'll publish somebody uh, on the right. Uh, but mostly today, to get into the New York Times op-ed pages, you need to pass a litmus test. Uh, an anti-Trump litmus test, a, uh, a left litmus test. That isn't the way it used to be. The New York Times used to be a kind of centrist, more conservative uh, newspaper. Then it became a centrist, more liberal newspaper, and now it's far, far, far left. And I think part of the reason is the young people. For young people who are today in the 
newsrooms of the New York Times, in the newsrooms of CNN, in the newsrooms of social media, there's no such thing as liberalism. You can't be a liberal. Pick sides. You're either on the left or on the right. And if you're on the left, the group you hate the most are liberals. That's always been the case. The Bolsheviks hated the Mensheviks because the Mensheviks were too liberal. The Bolsheviks were the revolutionaries and, and, and they were going to kill all the, all the dissenters. Uh, historically, the hard left, the greatest enemy of the hard left has been liberals because we're compromisers. We're people who are willing to hear all sides of, of every issue. So three cheers for liberalism. Um, I wrote a whole book about it recently, The Case for Liberalism in an Age of Extremism. In my book, I lay out what I think a liberal is. I think there are a lot more liberals out there that are willing to use that label. You know, when people run for office, the last thing they want to be called is a liberal. The polls show that if you get the label liberal, you're going to lose votes. The left will vote against you. The right will vote against you. You'll get centrist votes, but the center has been squeezed out. So the Der Show is liberal. I'm a liberal. I accept points of views different from my own. I welcome conservative thought. I welcome left-wing thought. I invite people from the left and right to debate me, and we're going to have more and more guests now that the Trump era is over and that uh, the idea of having to pick sides maybe, maybe will be diminished uh, uh, somewhat. You know, I used to think that Joe Biden was the liberal candidate, and in some respects he is a liberal. I was very disappointed with what he said at the town meeting the other day about China's repressive policies. He described it as part of a different Chinese culture. Well, you know, this kind of cultural relativism can take us only so far. What China is doing is repressive. He's repressing uh, many, many ethnic groups, the leader of China. Um, he's building concentration camps. He's trying to impose rigid Chinese totalitarianism on previously free and open Hong Kong. And I urge uh, President Biden to return to his liberal roots. He was part of that liberal group in the Senate. Ted Kennedy and, and, and uh, Joe Biden were, uh, were the liberals. Uh, Joe Lieberman. Um, these voices today have either been silenced or move to the left, some have moved to the right. I've been accused of moving to the right. I haven't budged, I haven't moved to the right at all. I still support all the same programs that I've supported over the years, gay rights, gay marriage, uh, the right for a woman to choose abortion, though I think abortion is a very complicated moral issue. I wanna leave it largely to democracy rather than the courts, but I support a woman's right to choose, yeah, I don't believe people should be able to own AK-44s and automatic weapons, and I think that mentally ill people shouldn't be able to get guns, and I don't support the NRA's extremism on guns. I, I'm, I'm a liberal. I'm a liberal on the environment, and I'm a liberal on social issues, health care, and taxation. Uh, but I'm a dying breed. Uh, I don't consider myself a leftist. I certainly don't consider myself part of the hard left, the censorial hard left. Uh, and um, as a liberal, I feel a special obligation to oppose the hard left. I've made this point before. I think centrist conservatives had a special obligation and have a special obligation to oppose the hard right, to oppose white nationalism and white supremacy and uh, other extreme forms of hard right, hard, hard right the same way I think liberals have an obligation to oppose the extremes of the hard left. You know, look, we're a centrist country. If you do polls and you ask people's opinion on a range of issues, I'm not talking about the policymakers, I'm not talking about the pundits, I'm not talking about CNN, I'm not talking about the editorial room of the New York Times, I'm talking about the average guy on the street. You ask a range of opinions of men and women all around America, and you will find most Americans are closer to the center than they are to the extremes of right and left. But what's happened 
is the media, the pundits, the universities have pushed us toward right and left. And that's not a good thing for America. We thrive at the center. We were and are the greatest country in the world because we never had a strong communist party. We never had a strong fascist party. Unlike Europe, which in the 20s and the 30s, and certainly by the time we got to the 40s, but the 20s and the 30s, Europe was divided into communists and fascists. And that's why so many people supported fascism. They weren't in favor necessarily of Hitler. They just hated communism, and they thought that fascism was the answer to communism. And I think the same thing was true of why people became uh, communists. They hated fascism. Uh, we were lucky. We had Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He was neither a communist nor a fascist. He was a liberal, a liberal, a capitalist. He saved capitalism through liberalism, through Social Security, through the New Deal. I wish we could see a return to that kind of tolerant liberalism. Well, you're going to see it on The Der Show. Uh, that's the perspective I will be presenting. A liberal, civil libertarian, centrist, tolerant, open-minded perspective. Welcome views on both extremes. But the hope is that now that the very divisive Trump presidency and anti-Trump presidency is over, we can see our country move back toward the center where we thrive. I know I'm going to get a lot of pushback on this from viewers and listeners, both on the right and on the left, and I welcome your views. So let's now turn to your perspectives on The Der Show. Let's begin with today's first phone call. Hi, this is Josh from Wisconsin. I had a question about free speech and higher education and the extent of student free speech relating to displaying messages via Zoom classrooms, uh, either wearing a shirt or displaying some other type of memorabilia um, within that environment. Uh, do they have a right to do so? And if so, under what court precedents or law would that apply? And if not, um, what are the restrictions on that? It's a great question. Uh, the leading case uh, involving high schools is a case called Tinker, um, where uh, a student came to school, I think it was a t-shirt, I can't remember exactly, um, uh, which carried an anti-Vietnam War message. And the Supreme Court upheld his right to do so. My favorite case along those lines, though, is a case uh, involving a guy named Cohen, who during the Vietnam War wore a jacket in a courthouse. And the jacket said F, and then it had the next words, the next letters, the draft, F the draft. Um, and when it came, and it was, he was punished and held in contempt or whatever, case came to the United States Supreme Court. And his lawyer got a letter from the marshal of the Supreme Court saying, we all know what the F word is, uh, but please do not attack the dignity of the court by actually saying the F word in the courthouse itself. And of course, the lawyer got up and said, Mr. Chief Justice, may it please the court. And then he yelled out the F word in full every single letter of it. He screamed it out. And he looked at the justices and said, see, the pillars still stand. The nation still survives. He was very smart because if he had refused to use the F word, he would have been giving in to the other side, admitting that the F word is not a word that can be used in political dialogue. And the Supreme Court upheld Justice Harlan, a very conservative man, a man who had never probably used that word in his whole life. I remember once delivering, I was a law clerk, delivering a petition on a death penalty case to have him sign at 10 o'clock at night at his home. Um, and I walked into his home and his butler greeted me and there he was sitting at one end of the table wearing evening clothes, like a, a tuxedo. And his wife was wearing a, a gown and that was their dinner. I mean, he was such an old-fashioned guy. And he wrote the opinion justifying the use of the F word, saying one man's obscenity is another man's lyric. Um, and so 
uh, messages. Uh, I remember once sitting at a um, Red Sox game, and I was sitting behind home plate, and a guy sitting a few seats away from me um, had a, a, a shirt that said, Yankees suck. And um, they came over and they made him either put his jacket on on top of the shirt or uh, leave the stadium because because he was sitting behind home plate. Every time they threw a pitch, you could see his shirt with Yankees suck. Uh, Fenway Park's private. So uh, these are hard questions. Uh, What you can wear to school, what you can wear on Zoom. Uh, There is an ability to limit um, things um, if they are deeply offensive based on time, manner, locations. Um, So... Uh, There's no definitive answer. I think in general, the courts tend to resolve these cases in favor of free speech, certainly during the golden age of free speech, whether or not that still exists in the minds of the justices of the Supreme Court. We'll wait and see. My name is Sandra Doan from Jacksonville, Florida. I'm concerned in the new administration when I hear uh, references to these equity programs, and I'm not quite sure what that means. Do they possibly violate the individual rights under the Constitution? Thank you. Thank you for this great show. I, I completely agree with you. I'm very concerned also that um, in an effort to create uh, greater sensitivity toward equality and away from racism, we are going to start demanding loyalty tests. And what if you're a dissenter? What if you don't necessarily agree with the programs that are now being pushed? Uh, for example, the public schools in New York, uh, one public school in New York, it was a big story in the paper the other day, how it's demanding all parents of students to examine your whiteness. And it gave a scale of seven degrees of whiteness, um, white supremacy, privilege, uh, benefit, uh, et cetera. They see the world in racial terms. They have a right to do that, but they have no right to impose that on the children in school. They have no right to impose it on people who see the world differently. We have the right to believe in Martin Luther King's view, which most black leaders today categorically reject, at least the leaders that are making these kind of decisions reject. Um, Someday, King said, I hope my children and grandchildren will be able to live in a world where people are judged by the quality of their character and not the color of their skin. No, that's not what we're hearing today. We're hearing today identity politics. People should be judged by the color of their skin. And if they're white, they get a demerit. And if they're white, heterosexual, male, oh my God, you know, uh, Yale, male, and pale, uh, you can't get anywhere today if you fit those uh, characteristics uh, of privilege. So, Yeah, I think racial justice is extremely important, but imposing a particular view on everybody, ranging from elementary school students to people who want to get jobs in universities. The University of Chicago uh, had a program in its English department, one of the most famous English departments in the world, uh, requiring basically an oath of allegiance toward um, their view of how to change the curriculum. Shakespeare is being banned uh, from certain curriculum, school curriculums, because he's a racist, a sexist, a misogynist, an anti-Semite, you name it. He's also the greatest writer uh, in the English language. He invented, uh, along with the King James Version of the Bible, modern modern English. And uh, the idea that we ban it because uh, he reflected the views of his time, teach it, teach it. And teach the views of his time. I'll never forget a meeting I had. My wife and I went to see The Merchant of Venice in New York. Um, and um, and we went backstage because I'm a friend or I know Al Pacino. And um, uh, I asked him and I videotaped it because I was teaching a class on Shakespeare and the law. Yes, I taught a class on Shakespeare and the law. I also taught a class on baseball and the law. But in my class on Shakespeare and the law... Uh, I asked Pacino, who just finished playing uh, Shylock, uh, is Merchant of Venice an anti-Semitic play or is it a play about anti-Semitism? And of course, Pacino, who's very, very smart, said it depends on how the actor plays it. And the way he played it, 
it was a play about anti-Semitism and the scourge of anti-Semitism. Who knows what was in the mind of Shakespeare? But Shakespeare is such a great writer that you can interpret him and use him to teach a range of issues. Othello obviously reflects very, very stereotyped views of black people, of Moors. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Othello is a very sympathetic character, whereas Iago is, is not. Um, so it's complicated. Shakespeare is complex, and the world today doesn't like complexities. It likes simplicity. You're on the side of blacks, you're on the side of whites. Pick a side. Choose. Trump. Anti-Trump. Black. White. No. That's not the way we resolve issues in a complicated world. Professor Dershowitz, this is Don from Arlington, Virginia. Absolutely love your show. You have been advocating for a voter integrity panel, a VIP, and have challenged those of us who have serious doubts, to say the least, about the legitimacy of the 2020 presidential election. And that if such a panel were to be formed, you have challenged our side to agree with the findings and stop claiming the election was stolen. Now, if 144 scholars can tell us that what President Trump did on January 6th was not protected by the First Amendment, when we clearly know that it was from what you have been taught us, then why should we trust a VIP comprised of scholars if they were to tell us the, the, the election was legitimate? My question to you is this. If, in the unlikely event, the VIP consisted of all Alan Dershowitz, Dershowitz type members who could be honest and nonpartisan and non anti Trump. And the VIP determined that Trump actually won. What is the constitutional remedy? Also, if you were heading up the VIP, would you release the results that showed he actually, that Trump actually won, knowing what the reaction would be on both sides? Mm -hmm. Thank you for your time. Great, great questions. Of course, the last question, of course, I'd release the results. I don't believe in suppressing results. Let the chips fall where they may. I think the difference between a VIP panel and the 144 scholars, the 144 scholars were self-selected. They were all anti-Trumpers. Um, they all had uh, prior experience, uh, pretty much all of them, um, uh, expressing negative views uh, about um, um, the uh, uh, Trump presidency and positive views about impeachment. Yes, they re represented some Republicans, some Democrats, but all anti-Trump people. Uh, the VIP panel would consist of uh, nonpartisan experts, um, not only scholars, as I've mentioned, former justices of the Supreme Court, former presidents of universities, priests, rabbis, and ministers, uh, scientists from all points of view. But I agree with you, the composition of the panel would be absolutely critical. Um, President Biden has now suggested that, uh, and I think Vice President Harris as well, suggested that there be a, and, 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 and Speaker Pelosi, I think it's her idea primarily, that there be a panel like the 9-11 Commission looking into the causes of the invasion of the Capitol on January 6th. Uh, I don't trust her to pick that panel. Um, I would need to know what the input is. Uh, a, a panel or a group of experts are no better than the method by which they're selected. And we live in such a partisan world today that um, the uh, nature of who you put on a panel is the determinative factor. Um, but yes, if there were a legitimate panel, one that I respected, I would respect the result. And if the result said that, no, the election was fraudulent and stolen, have to give credit to that. I don't think the result would come out that way. That's my bias. Maybe I can't serve on the panel because I have a predisposition toward believing that the election was not stolen. Uh, as you know, I believe there were some problems with it in Pennsylvania uh, and perhaps other places, constitutional problems, and perhaps there were problems of voter suppression, I'm sure, on both sides. In fact, most voter suppression is of Democrats, not of Republicans, because it tends to be of minority voters who tend to vote Democrat. But look, you're right. The composition of the panel, the composition of the commission would be the key, key factor. But I would accept the results, and I would certainly not suppress them. 
Um, yes, Professor Dershowitz, I was listening to your um, to your commentary about the Trump end game that you um, that you made today, and the question that 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 kind of um, I don't hear anyone mentioning is if it was a fair election for Donald Trump as or or unfair election for um for Joe Biden if they felt like that it was so unfair to Donald Trump and 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 very fair to Joe Biden why didn't they why didn't they just go ahead and do a um why didn't Joe Biden himself say well I want to end this I want this to be a fair square election why don't I just go ahead on and um we do a um a computer audit and not just the audit, an all-around check, uh, uh, seeing that there were votes over county. If Joe Biden wanted to have a fair election, uh, or you know, he didn't have to accept the nomination that the media gave him. That is my dispute on that. It's an interesting point. Uh, we know that the election was disputed by Donald Trump very vigorously, still is to this day. Um, should Biden have said, look, I want to make sure everybody accepts the results of the election, so I'm prepared to um, file an amicus brief saying the Supreme Court should take the case and look at it. I'm confident the court would come out my way, but let the court look at it. Be an interesting, interesting perspective. Uh, it's a lot to expect from a winner of an election when he's been announced the winner uh, challenging his own election. But it's a, it's a very interesting perspective. It certainly would have uh, given more credibility uh, to the election um, on the part of those who today still continue to dispute it. Professor Dursowitz, this is Ryan from Utah. I recently found your podcast, and I have to say I've been very impressed about your unwavering support for the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and specifically as of late, the First Amendment. I uh, wanted to get your take on something. The Democrats have been very public about their all-out assault on the First Amendment through this impeachment process and trial. But going on in the background, they've also started an assault on the Second Amendment through House Bill 127 that's been introduced in the House. Just curious, wanted to get your thoughts on that bill, its constitutionality, and whether or not you think it will actually move forward. Uh, thank you, and appreciate your show. Well, thanks for giving me a homework assignment. I don't know what Bill 127 is, so I have to do my homework. I, as soon as the show's over, I will read the bill and give you my assessment of its constitutionality. I'll just tell you in general, um, if I were writing the Constitution today or if I were writing it back 225 years ago, I would not have included a Second Amendment. I don't think the right to bear arms um, deserves the status of a constitutional right. I think we're the only constitution in the world that has the right to bear arms. Somebody told me that maybe there's something in the Swiss constitution about it, but we're certainly among the only countries in the world that have a right to bear arms. To me, that's more of a legislative matter. Uh, it should be decided not as a matter of constitutional law, but as a matter of legislative uh, uh, preference. But the Second Amendment's there, and I don't want to change it. I would have written the Fourth Amendment differently. I would have written the Fifth Amendment differently. Um, I would have probably even strengthened the First Amendment, but I don't get to write the Constitution, and I don't get to want to amend it because I like the Bill of Rights. And um, I think if you start amending any of the Bill of Rights, you'll end up amending many of the Bill of Rights. So I accept the Second Amendment, and I accept the Supreme Court's decision in Heller, though I think it could easily have gone the other way. The Second Amendment is drafted horribly, D- in draftsmanship. It doesn't tell us, basically, whether there is an individual right to own and possess weapons. It talks about militias and et cetera. And so there's a historical dispute about what is meant by the Second Amendment, but I don't want to abolish it. But I'm in favor of reasonable gun control. The word reasonable appears in the Second Amendment. So I'm in favor of uh, a reasonable uh, approach to gun control, which means um, a waiting period. It means disqualification of violent felons and mentally ill. It means ending the loopholes that allow people to buy guns at, at, at flea markets and gun fairs. No, I don't like that. So I'd have to look at every statute on its face uh, and see whether or not I personally agree with it. But in the end, it's up to the people and then ultimately up to the courts.
Well, with great questions again, uh, a seminar in constitutional law ranging from the First Amendment to the Second Amendment to the integrity of elections. Uh, Great, great questions. I always enjoy the wits that really completes The Der Show. So let's have more of your questions and please more of you subscribe, tell your friends about it. Everybody who watches and listens to the show seems to like it. So I want to get more people to listen to it because I'd like more people to like it and more people to call in. So expecting your call on The Der Show. An important part of The Der Show is your voice, your questions, your comments. Please call 24-7. The number is 216-710-0050. Keep your comments short and to the point. Again, the number for you to call 24-7 is 216-710-0050. Hard questions, criticisms, everything's fine. Just keep your questions short and I'll answer them all on The Dirt Show. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut, 06904. Or you can call the JBS pledge line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.